The Permanent Secretary, Prince Danfa, National Coordinator, COVID Response in the Gambia, Mr. Sayan, Sayan. all the um, partners around in the media. Let me stand on the existing protocol and discuss what we have been doing here for the past five days. From Tuesday, 6th of April, um, the WHO Afro and the country office in the Gambia, together with the partners and Ministry of Health, had come together to discuss the activities we have been doing for the, uh, for the COVID-19 response from March to December 2020. During these days, we looked at the what worked well, what we did so well in the response activities and the enabling factors, what didn't do, go on so well, the challenges and the limiting factors and their impacts. And then we now finally, finally looked at how to improve on the identified challenges so that next time or the on, in, during the ongoing um, response we will do better than what we did last year. Finally today after this closing ceremony we are going to also look at uh, the response plan and update it. We are going to use the challenges we identified and the recommendations and then the best practices and update the old plan so that what we have on table going forward will represent and work for us going forward. So that what we have um, on table will help us to keep fighting the COVID, ongoing COVID pandemic. I don't have so much. I think we have a, this is all we have done for the past five days. And I'm going to request that after this closing ceremony, when the minister and the team has gone, we'll see, sit down and finalize the response plan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ifani, uh, for giving us uh, that introductory remark as to what has happened here before. Uh, looking at the uh, looking at the interaction uh, review for the 20, COVID-19 response. The interaction review was mainly we were looking at ourselves, what we have done so far, uh, how did we do it, what were the challenges, and the way forward. So this was also very useful, and this that goes across all the thematic areas. And it also provided us an opportunity to add additional thematic areas, which we felt they are necessary. And then that was also done. So this was also a very good, important exercise uh, for the entire sector. And we also had the participation of um, all the stakeholders in this, uh, especially those who are involved in the implementation of the COVID-19 response plan. Next on the agenda is to have an input that has been provided by the participants during plenary. Uh, this look at the summary of the issues that have been discussed in the five day, uh, four days up to today morning and then also key recommendations. So this is also going to be presented by uh, Dr. Mustafa Bite. Uh, Mr. B Dr. Bite, kindly move on with the presentation. Thank you. So but just before we start, we want to thank the Minister of Health for uh, making this possible. Um, for allowing all of these very important people to be here for this long, you know, with a lot of work that we need to do. And also all the participants for the frank way that have attended some of the discussions and it's been very frank, open, so that uh, not with no hidden agenda, just to ensure that we see how to improve our system. Um, the organizers present, um, especially to Dr. Ifani, Dr. Nyasi, who is not 
present here today has been very instrumental and I Shenjai are in the forefront in running around the organizations and everything. So we really appreciate their effort uh, for making this a big success. Uh, we also want to thank our partners, WHO, for facilitating the whole process. It's, this started a long time ago, and we have subsequent comments, like the interaction review uh, for the vaccines and others, and all the other partners who are present here to make sure that the input is better. And then we finalize this today, and this will be put into the uh, uh, the plan for 2021. So we also thank the minister for making himself available so that we can have this finalized and he have his input. And it will give us, how do we do this? Is give us the opportunity to share our experiences and to analyze what is ongoing and document and apply lessons learned from the response effort so far and then try to see what enabling factors work well and what were the challenges, best practices. And the challenges, we work on them, bring proof of new solutions. The best practices, we try to institutionalize it, to make it long term, because this is just for COVID, and we see how we put it in our system. And at, at the end, then we have a plan for 2021 that we will work on and uh, help guide our actions. So we, these are the teams that were available, uh, coordination, surveillance. But initially, like you will see later in the response, is that we Initially, we match them, and some of the recommendations is probably to ma make them look like st some of them to stand alone pillars. But this is what all these areas are uh, what we are focused on, and uh, in in the uh, in the res in the deliberations here, uh, the coordination, surveillance, points of entry, laboratory, case management, you know, IPC, logistics and safety, and risk communication mental health and psychosocial and research, continuity of essential services. So, so the good things and the best practices that we see are things that we thought that we've done very well. And probably, uh, you know, sometimes you may not even need an activity again to strengthen that. Or maybe your activity would be to see how to institutionalize it or how to make it better and how to just improve a little. But generally, it has served the purpose um, or with little to it probably. So we've established many of an incident management structure, including the subcommittees. I think this was a good attempt, and it enabled effective response. Uh, it allowed the development and production of a health response plan, and it allowed for better collaboration with partners. So this gave the structure that at least may not be perfect, but it allowed for uh, at least some uh, for the type of response that we have to get, allow us to yield the results that we have, which uh, we can improve on, but we are all proud of. Um, so regular coordination meetings uh, with the regular production of situation, situational reps. reps um, si yes, sit reps. This was, this is one of the hallmark. You know, what Gambia, I'm sure, has done very well in this area. And uh, we've been having our regular meetings for over one year very strenuous, but uh, it has been sustained and, um, and it always culminates. We are few, most countries, after some time of the response, has actually stopped the situational reports they were doing, or they've increased the, uh, the duration between the situational reports. But Gambia has, with little maybe uh, exceptions once in a while, has continuously maintained uh, the situational reports come in regularly. Up till now, that's happening. And then, so the meetings were very helpful. Initially, they were daily, and so it allowed for adjustment. So, you know, it allows for review of what is happening almost real time. Almost every day, you review, and where you need to adjust minor ones without changing the whole plan, this was made possible by this. Um, so there was an establishment of the multi-sectoral procurement and finance committee. Because if we go by the the rules, there would have been a lot of letters from Minister of Health to Minister of Finance to Procurement, and it was very difficult. So establishment of this committee allowed for all those members to sit in one place, there's a presentation, then they all understand it together. Then now, once the letters go, it's very easy, and the process is, is still followed, but it, this committee made it easier. So you can, and it was still, there's room for improvement. And can you imagine how it was if it was just going to the communication by letters alone? So this has really helped to improve the procurement process, albeit not to what we would uh, 
want as the response here. Provisions of substantial funding from government through the GL GLF, you know. So this was the government put in a lot of resources you know, in the response, and this has uh, made partners also to come forward and put in a lot more resources. So it has encouraged everyone to come on board, and that's a big strength. So there was weak coordination at all levels. So what we meant by here is that you have the central level, you have the regional levels, and uh, also even the subcommittees. Sometimes there was, like for example, what discussed at the central level finds it very difficult to reach at the regional level and all that. So it, it was, but within the central level alone, there was a, uh, some very good form of communication between the NEC and the, uh, the coordinating committees and all that. But there was a big difference when what we decide, how does it reach now at the regional level, that was a big, uh, sometimes within the subcommittees too. So something could be shared with the team leads, for example, and maybe some members of the team, it takes time before they get to know even the policies and all. So we need to, so there's an intra-issue that we need to work out and there is also an inter-issue that we need to, between the committees and between the central and the regional levels and between the coordinating and maybe the neck and other. So there's, there's need for improvement in the coordination and communication between these levels. Uh, so the, the PHEOC is non-functional. Um, we are just, by, by rules, by regulations, it is not yet um, enacted so that it's on functions like that. But uh, we've started using the IMS, and um, so obviously there is, we need to make it functional and providing all the, uh, the, the regulations and tools that are needed. Um, make sure that the segregations of duties are clear because right now it's not clear. And then we also ensure that it embeds the IMS system because that's not happening right now. And so all these things are major issues that we need to work on. Uh, and so, like we said, the poor communication at different levels, it impedes a lot the response mechanism uh, because you know the, the communication is not going. So we adhere either to the true structure, so we say you either select one, uh, to, to go with, like the IMS system, and make sure that all these structures are aligned to the IMS system, and we work. this should, go, should happen very fast in the next plan, and then we try to use all the structures that are in the IMS. Um, this one also, we think that through the National Assembly and through a lot of advocacy, we have to put it to the, in the regulations of the GPPA, that in terms of emergency, single sourcing you know, is norm or we have to relax some of the procurement rules and all in terms of emergency. This has to really happen. Otherwise, if, if no matter what, even forming that committee, while still going through all those checks, um, it will also cause a little, a lot more delays. So uh, we have to find a mechanism of putting this, that in, once the emergency system is triggered, a straight away trigger a measure that allows procurement very fast. Um, so this one we've talked about the, uh, enacting of the necessary laws, and also establish incident management structures at decentralized level. So this, you know, the structures have been there, we've discussed them, but actually it's not functional. So we have to try to make it functional, ensure that uh, it reaches the regional level, they have the incident management system there, which links with the central level, and allows them to undertake and do the response with uh, a little independence and reporting, and so this, this really we need to work on uh, for the next plan. So the, sur the surveillance also, some of the very good practices, like adapted existing surveillance tools for COVID-19 uh, surveillance. Like, so this one we've done very well. We've used the tools, there are templates provided, which are internationally recognized and we've used them. So this will allow timely detection and follow-up of contacts. And, and we've also standardized the operation, uh, operational procedures. So this is important because it allows us not to, it allowed us to work very fast and early and started the case definition, shared it with all, and we started picking cases very early. Surveillance officers and community-based volunteers train on the use of adapted COVID-19 surveillance tools. So a lot of training we had done, and it was very innovative during the COVID. 
because normally we'd have this type of trainings, but when the COVID was at this time, you know, we you know, innovated a nice way of going to facilities, having small groups, and it worked well, less costly, and you know, these are very good practices that we've done and to help sensitize our staff and train them on the uh, surveillance tools and all. Sample collection has been decentralized, um, although there's still a lot of work, but it's, it's good that uh, most of the facilities are trained on how to collect samples, uh, so it's just a matter of uh, uh, people also being volunteering and be ready, and, and also improve access to sample collection. We are not having only one side where we are collecting samples, we even have for the communities and all, so this has helped. So, Finances, you know, because these frontline and surveillance officers, they have to work continuously, whether it's public holiday, all of us in the response. So um, sometimes the incentive is not very, uh, maybe too attractive, um, uh, but uh, that's the issue. So they work in public holidays, weekends, work overtime, and you know, so this has led to some decrease in the staff motivation. And, and so there is a risk of, you know, uh, affecting quality. If somebody is working overtime every day, every day, so sometimes the concentration and all, and the, they may have a short fuse, the approach and all that, which should always be 100% okay because when we deal with the community. So it may affect the quality of the service. And so one way to do this, uh, maybe we will talk about the uh, recommendation uh, is to increase. Um, there's risk of uh, decreased quality of service delivery if we have uh, inadequate mobility. Uh, if, this, if we have um, uh, motorbikes and all, we, we bought a lot of motorbikes, a lot of vehicles, but the country is big, it's very porous, and so we still need more uh, for, to be able to run this. So I think the recommendation would be we need to uh, provide more mobility for surveillance officers and also uh, maybe provide more staff, surveillance officers, and also uh, maybe motivate also by some incentives. Uh, this will help to uh, uh, to, to uh, help in the motivation and the morals. Um, so, so for point of entry, so POE staff sensitize on COVID-19 surveillance and infection prevention and control measures. This was done very early, and I think this was a very good practice. I think it was you know, very, very early in when the, fo the first meeting we had the minister, almost the next day they went around, start training, start, so it is, this, and, and since then, it's always normal for the um, POEs to go regularly to train them, check what they are doing, supervision, and they've been always in the field, and I think this is something that has helped a lot to the awareness of our people at that place. And then they are also trained on IPC a lot, uh, infection prevention and control. Now, uh, uh, we've, we've also done very well with our neighbors in Senegal, uh, have some few interactions to ensure that there is inter-country information sharing of data so that the response uh, for both sides would be better and uh, we'll uh, get the results that we need. So even with that, uh, there are challenges, and so we have uh, the implementation of the PA operational plan. It's not well um, done in all places, and so there is need to, to improve on that. Inadequate structures and provisions for holding centers at the POE. So we have some centers that have this, but not all. And so we need to work on that so that if you get someone from the border, you can ask them to hold on and there until the required intervention is done. So we need to ensure that we have resources put forward for POEs to, to follow the operational plans and to have it, provide uh, the structures that are required for this, and also uh, because they are at the border moving around, you know, the required mobility should also be there. Um, so the laboratory surveillance, this one, um, best practices, efficient sample collection, transportation, and testing system. So this, this is a big one because when we started, it was not available. And uh, now uh, uh, we have experts who are doing a lot of testings. They are doing even manufacturing VTMs. And so this is a big leap. Uh, and then now they are trying to expand to other areas. 
uh, and then uh, you know the testing they have the capacity to do the testing and so because of that we are not waiting for five days or ten days uh, to to have confirmation of suspected cases now within 24 or 48 hours in Gambia you'll be able to confirm the cases and, and because it's done in the country and also reduce turnaround time um, decentralization of COVID-19 testing centers and sample collection sites so there this has been decentralized now there's already work going on they have the machines some, for some of the sites to start the decentralization and um, they're using also the rapid test kits for some of the sites so the airport and others so the testing is decentralized also the, the sample collection is also decentralized although we all say that uh, like we're going to see uh, as a challenge is not adequate um, so the capacity at the at the at the NPHL has increased in human resources and and the the space and the environment to be able to do higher level testing and and then there's also been increase in the number of staff to help in this so even though there is increase or decentralized testing and sample collection sites but you know there is still you know a lot of work that needs to be done and to help improve also increase the numbers to expand it uh, because then there is still what we what we have is not adequate we still think there is delayed there is delay in testing delay in issuing results and there is also uh, the public not really coming up to to do the testing so we really want to improve on that um, we've also have test kits and reagents consumable once a while run low and you know and this could lead to delay in testes may also lead to compromised quality of work so we have low incentive for laboratory personnel working extra hours on COVID-19 sample collection and testing. This is the same so for like the surveillance, they are working every day 24 hours and also whether public holiday or weekends. And so um, it's, it's a lot of work and there's risk of it compromising the service. So there should be some resting system, increasing the numbers and also uh, some incentives to, uh, to, to, uh, to allow for why they are staying all that time. Um, recommendations provide adequate quality and consistent supply of test kits, reagents, and consumables, provide additional national sample testing centers. So this is what we are working on towards the plan to make sure that the supplies are always now available, not to wait until there is two months supply left or one month supply or two weeks supply, which will put the management into a big distress if you are left with only one week supply or so. So now we need to always have uh, uh, consistent supply. These things are not provided in Gambia, so once you need them, if you get the money, you don't easily get it. So there should be a system to ensure that you are always stuck in six months before and uh, not to wait until there's two months or a few weeks left. Um, and provide uh, national sample centers, testing centers, this we need to work on uh, to improve the testing area. Provide the allowances that are required for personnel uh, for the extra hours put in. Uh, especially at the collection and at the testing size. Now, this capacity at the, at the NPH is very high. Uh, sequencing could be done. And so it's time to, in the next level, to see how we can also put forward that so that our own staff now will be doing the sequencing. And then provide mobility for the laboratory services, especially for the up country, so that you can um, uh, collect all those samples. And that will be helpful. Uh, uh, risk communication and community engagement. So the five best practices, uh, existence of functional national and regional RCC committee with defined TORs. So there is a committee with the TOR and it has stakeholders um, who are participatory in all the activities and give input. And this includes partners and very important stakeholders. So one of the big, big achievements is the 1025. You know, this is now a mantra in the country. Everyone knows about the 1025, and it's a big success. So uh, it's been run continuously throughout the period, and uh, it gives access to correct information and on time. Um, there could be some issues once a while, but generally, middle of the night, you call them. They still work out. I've tested it many times, and it works. 
So um, sometimes we have issues with the lines jam and all, so, but generally it's been run continuously without uh, problem. So there have been regular press briefings and press releases and updates. This has been done even at the level of the minister um, and you know, the, uh, the president's spokesperson, uh, our risk communication. Everybody has been involved really in the, so that they build transparency and trust and confidence. And I think this is one thing that the response has garnered for us because uh, the, I think the public trust the information that is coming from the ministry because of even where the information was not very platable to the Minister of Health, we have come out straight away to say that this is what is happening and, and rumor management and addressing misconception. Existence of interpersonal communication networks and alliances at all levels. Uh, that is the National Council of Safe Follows, Religious Leaders, VDCs, uh, Community Drama Groups, TCs, VSGs. Uh, improve access and acceptance of information, ease coordination of community mobilization. These are the structures that we use to go to, the, uh, to engage the communities and to help improve. So partner engagement on resource mobilization has also been good. Uh, so a lot of resources has been raised on these issues and uh, potential stakeholders mapped for, to, to help with this. So engagement of village health workers and community volunteers to support contract tracing. This has been piloted and has done very well in, in two regions. Collaboration with psychosocial subgroups and politicians in COVID-19 response. This also had worked very well where we had uh, resistance and you know, from very, so we've, these are methods utilized by the group uh, to ensure acceptance and improve tidiness of response to allow people to go to the treatment center. I think this is one of the areas that we've done also very well, uh, to use different approaches to ensure that uh, we get the response that we need. So some of the challenges like operational, so bureaucratic procedures to access funds. So some of the times to get the funds from the Central level, you know, there's a lot of delay, and then it's very difficult to to, to uh, quickly get the funds and act. Uh, capacity building, monitoring, and supervision also needs to be improved. And lack of risk communication plans and strategies at regional levels. Uh, this is, I think, a general issue uh, that you know we've not been communicating very well and ensuring that uh, what happens at the central level also happens at the regional level. Um, Insufficient coordination uh, with the stakeholders. There is some coordination, but you know, it could be improved. Implementation challenges, misconceptions, and denials in the public. Slow adherence to COVID-19 precautionary measures. Uh, you know, all these are, uh, are implementation challenges. Need for the definition of standard operating procedures, including but not limited to rules of engagement of the uh, committee. And then use of inappropriate channels and communication tools is also a problem. Uh, limited media and rumor monitoring as well as uh, management. So recommendations uh, to develop resource mobilization and advocacy plan, um, you know, conduct monitoring and supportive supervision of COVID-19, RCC intervention, intervention at all levels. Uh, develop RCC SOPs and TOR for different stakeholders. This is to address all the challenges listed so that in this current plan, uh, we will de uh, solve all those problems. Uh, establish a more robust rural management team at national and regional level with clear TOR SOPs and plans and support the development and implementation of a comprehensive risk communication and community engagement strategic plan. So if all these are taken care of, inshallah, uh, it, the uh, the response in that area will be much better. So for case management, these are the people who deal with the patients. So uh, use oxygen cylinders. Uh, this is one of the best practices is that since the response started, even with the very increased amount of um, oxygen needs, there has always been a continuous supply of oxygen. Even where the plant that's only available in the country breaks down, there is still some oxygen available. There is probable reduction of mortalities and saving needed families from buying oxygen. We think that uh, there has been a reduction of mortalities, but a more objective assessment will be needed to give uh, this. And uh, families have been prevented or 
saved from having to buy this very expensive health commodity. Purchase and centralized supply and distribution of drugs and medical consumables free of charge. So this is available. All the treatment, everything that the patients receive has been at a free, free cost. And then we've also increased the capacity. Now, you know, the number of beds we are doing the sanatorium, now there are more facilities for, uh, for, for admission. So some of the challenges, no oxygen plant. Um, so low risk of stock out of gloves, mask, and heparin. Low or risk of stock out. So there has been times when, uh, you know, the, the gloves stocks was very low. Or, and then there, there are times when the people are jittery because there's a risk that there will be stock out of gloves and mask. So, um, and that will lead to uh, more problems. Inadequate budget for buying drugs and consumables. Um, so, uh, so the resources are not always available to, to uh, meet the medical consumables that are needed. No on-site laboratory in the treatment centers. So the treatment centers don't have lab. Uh, and most of the treatment centers, so all of them are mainly in region one. So that's a problem because the other centers are not yet operational. And then, then there's also problem of transporting all patients and suspects from regions to central level facilities. So right now, once it's confirmed, then you have to come to the treatment facilities, which are all in region one. So the UN, the temporary structures that are funded, which are almost ready, they are still not yet uh, finished and, and being used. And also there is no CT scan or MRI scan in these COVID facilities. So the only ones available are mainly for public use and they are being overutilized. So there's difficulty for, uh, there's need for CT scan and MRI uh, to help handle these challenges. Recommendation to mobilize resources for at least one oxygen plant and cylinders, to ensure adequate drugs and supplies, mobilize partners for procurement services, you know, equip on-site laboratories in treatment centers. So this is all some things that are recommended to make sure that they do the work within that. Expedite the finishing and commissioning of the three UN funded treatment centers and expedite the construction of the eight new treatment centers and refurbishment of isolation centers that is ongoing. <coughs> and that has to be also expedited so that all these facilities are ready for use quickly and they are also equipped with the necessary consumables, as like, such as oxygen, CT scan, and, and drugs. Uh, this is a committee that was sort of not very well uh, included into the system in the beginning until later when it has now started doing a lot of work within a very short, short time. Uh, they've developed an interaction plan already, you know, which uh, development of national COVID IPC technical guidelines. So this committee has been doing a lot of work. IPC SOPs, including safe and dignified burial and ambulance SOPs were also developed. And they've identified focal points at national, regional, and hospital levels and constructions of IPC and centers at the uh, Gamma Red Cross. So they've, they've uh, the, all the tools, they've done a lot of assessments and uh, have brought out all this. So, so a delay in disbursement of funds. Um, uh, so this is a general problem, delay in dissemination of the guidelines to the uh, required sites for use, inadequate circulation and absence of forms, inconsistency in full in screening and triad procedures, no or low compliance of IPC SOPs. So these are problems that are already uh, rec recognized and we should ensure that in the subsequent plan it's all taken care of. Um, they all boil down to more more funds also for the implementation of the plan and ensure timely dissemination of the guides and ensure people are trained on these tools and also monitored to make sure that they are doing it. Um, I think this is the last one. Uh, this tool just like the IPC was initially not included it was only after when the whole world was talking about uh, the neglect of the essential services uh, that it was also included into the response. Uh, they've also done a lot of work. They've established a national committee uh, and they've, they've done prevention. And because of that, which all, most of the partners were there and they contributed a lot, UNICEF, especially UNFPA in this committee, WHO, and I think that this committee has done a lot of work to prevent the debts, not related to COVID, but the other debts that we are going to, that have been denied maybe uh, attention because of COVID. 
avoidance of setbacks and on ongoing programs. Uh, supervision of program implementation and supply chain of medicines and equipment uh, is one of their also what they, where they've done well. Optimization of service delivery centers and platforms. Um, so they were also able to raise funds uh, to buy uh, PPEs material, and this is uh, this is for this is going to help really uh, the response in general because it's going to reduce the demand on the supplies meant for the response. So, uh, so some of the challenges are lack of organization in services to ensure functionality. So, so if it needs to be organized better, so that uh, the risk of more mortalities or more mortality will be reduced, uh, less coordination in service delivery during the response. So, if it is not, uh, it's not well also coordinated. Um, so, it's not yet because it, it came late. So, it was not in the original structures, and in this plan now, it could be there and. Lack of clear structure for the essential health services within the IMS, and this has made it difficult to identify the priority areas. So recommendation is that uh, develop mechanism to track service utilization data and implement comprehensive assessment, and develop capacity of healthcare workers and other stakeholders on the use of the guidelines. And so, sorry, there's also one more, I think, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, the logistics and safety. It's one of the big committees that has been from the beginning doing very well. Uh, so logistics capacity and national safety and security assessment conducted in March, April 2020. Um, most of uh, this is most of the time evidence based all their actions. Uh, they do assessment and present and so it's, it's very good system uh, to help inform the development of the revised plan. Uh, Regular and consistent meetings is also one committee that kept regular meetings, even their um, internal meetings is uh, well structured. And uh, uh, they also have helped in resource mobilization. So they've done adequate stock management and regular forecasts. So anytime we need to quantify the PPEs, so we've, we've always been forecasting because sometimes it's very dangerous to bring a lot of things and they get expired. So, so far, we don't have so many things getting expired that are not being utilized. So the forecasting and balancing, uh, looking at the delays in procurement and delivery and balancing it with too much expired things. So they've been really doing very well to ensure that we don't have the stockouts and we don't have too much things that we, uh, so I think uh, they've been doing a good job on that. Uh, so there's not been shortage of most of the essential supplies. Like there's not have been a time where like you see, totally say there are no gloves to totally too. So there could be limited amount, but uh, you know they've tried to ensure that throughout this time, you know we always have some uh, supplies. Establishment of functional national security task force uh, allowed coordination of different security sectors and regular joint patrols. So the challenges. Um, they are responsible for the security, the importation, uh, making sure. So we have importation of cases, we have spread of the virus. So probably uh, if the border security and all we are maybe very robust like it should be, probably. But this is very difficult because the whole world has have the cases. No matter where, all we are, but the security is 100% good. So I think it's a challenge, but they have been very generous, really. Um, but yes, the importation of cases and spread of the virus, um, it's, uh, it's, it's a problem. Slow implementation of plan activities and shortage of some essential supplies. Like um, you have sometimes reagents or consumables which will go very low. Lack of maintenance of some vehicles. Uh, it's been very, uh, they've had challenges in ensuring that some vehicles that are procured uh, put in the system so that they go through the routine maintenance. And this is a challenge which we have to work on. Adequate security provision at testing, treatment, and quarantine sites. Uh, the, the security has not been adequate and it has led to physical abuse of staff and it has led to escape of treatment, uh, people from the treatment center or quarantine sites, and it has led to interruption of services. So, so it's an area that, um, okay, so, so recommendation, sustain the multi-sectoral nature of the committee and stick adherence to their TOR, maintain and strengthen national security tax force, and so enforcement of COVID-19 regulations, and then, and so I believe, so I think we have now research and mental health. 
Yes. 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 I, I can, no, I should not skip them. Let me just finish quickly. So, um, research, establishment of research subgroup for COVID-19 response, I think, going forward. And it, they've done very well. They were part of the mental health. Existence of COVID-19 costed research work plan and increased interest of individuals and research and research-related institutions in COVID-19 research. So some of the challenges are lack of funding to implement planned research activities. Um, then um, there's lack of internet facility to facilitate the planning, coordination, and implementation of the research. And then the absence of national data sharing forum on studies conducted on COVID-19. And I think these are challenges we need to look at. And then uh, maybe conduct advocacy amongst the, and so that we prioritize the coordination and management of research allocate funds to conduct COVID-19 plan research activities, and also train key health research competencies, such as biostatisticians, demographer, and epidemiologists. So the mental health and psychosocial support, this is one area that we've done very well. So um, at the quarantine sites, at the treatment centers, you know, they've always been present from the beginning to ensure that they provide the services. Uh, they've also established CUG services for PSSR responders and existence of interpersonal interagency communication platform. Um, partner engagement on resource mobilization, development of service mappings. Uh, so they've been very helpful in developing these tools and also in ensuring that they mobilize funds. So still the fundings are not adequate and there's limited capacity to provide timely and effective services at all levels because it's not only the patients, but also the staff needs to be taken care of. So there's need to do capacity building for frontline workers and conduct uh, advocacy uh, for the funding of plan activities. So we go to the final, final slide, sorry. Uh, so these are the overarching recommendations. So, so these are just like a summary of all the recommendations that we have. Um, that is one to ensure that we, the incident management system is in order and ensure that all areas supporting the response are provided with the adequate resources. So the incident management system as a structure uh, needs to be developed and made robust and decentralized to reach all the levels. Review the mechanism for disbursement of allocated funds to take into consideration the emergency context. So this has been discussed, but it's a major issue to ensure that um, uh, the funds that we require, which is also available at the central level, there should be an easy mechanism of purchasing in the emergency so that the funds can be released and we can utilize them. Yeah. So, and so consistent and up-to-date information sharing across all levels of the response structure. Uh, we've said that already, and develop and ensure continuous monitoring and assessment of the implementation of COVID-19 response plan. So this is a new idea. Uh, already we have a lot of uh, committees that should be looking at this, but uh, we need to specifically have a group or tax to ensure that um, they look at, at every state what, what amount of the plan has been done to keep reminding each group what they should do, supervising and monitoring, and doing regular assessment to see how we are each of the planned things have been contributed. Also to finalize our national action plan on health security, because this response is all about security, and to ensure that all health emergency plans are aligned and with the, to, to develop and to help our system to be resilient. So I think these are some of the, if we go with few points, these are the points that we need to go home with. So sorry for taking all your time. So um, this is where we stop, and thank you very much for having us. I want to recognize the representatives of uh, UNFPA, UNICEF, WHO, FAO, IOM. They have been very, very uh, instrumental and supportive during this uh, five days process. Uh, we have been working together in partnership. So, yes, I want to, any questions from the floor with regards to the presentation or any comment? on the presentation. If no, well then we move on to the official opening or closing ceremony. Nothing yet? Then we are good to go. Uh, 
uh, just to remind uh, the Honorable Minister and team, the, the presentation here covers a summary of the best practices, challenges, and recommendations. But if you look at the main document, that will be available. It has detailed best practices, as well as challenges and recommendations from the various thematic areas. On that note, I now invite the WR, Dr. Dester, to give his statement. Okay. Do you have any sanitizer for the mic? Good afternoon now. Just turned to 12, so I'll say good afternoon. Uh, I'm very much delighted to be with you today. And uh, as you may have noticed, some of you, this week uh, we commemorated the 73rd World Health Day, the birthday of uh, the World Health Organization, which was, I think, you know, uh, came into being in 1948. And the central issue there is about equity, which is very, very important, particularly at this time, when we are dealing with major emergency. So I would like to say, Happy World Health Day. First of all, I would like to recognize protocol, Honorable Minister, Dr. Madhul Amin Samate. Peers, we have two pieces here. Peers Jaite, Peers Dampa, who have been in the center of the all action, Director of Health Services, the National COVID Response Coordinator, uh, and my colleagues from the UN system, uh, Sam Mills. And uh, there are also other colleagues here, apart from WHO staff. We have UNICEF, we have UNFP, IOM, WFP, uh, uh, FAO, UNDP. Some of them may not be here, but they have been active in the response, in supporting the response. So I would like to recognize their presence and their contribution in this interaction review. And also, Ministry of Health staff, who are actually at different levels of uh, the response, providing guidance and uh, support from the beginning of this uh, pandemic. And uh, uh, med uh, media personnel also who are here, and other also partners who are present here, supporting the Ministry of Health and the government response and uh, colleagues from the Defence Forces and other sectors of government and uh, directors of uh, regional health directorates who are present here, who have been here with, with us for the whole week. Uh, all your presence is uh, duly acknowledged. If I have left anybody out, please just to <laughs> make sure all protocols are duly observed and uh, respected. First of all, I just would like to give you the, the gist of what's happening. I think for some of you may not be following here on a daily basis. We have reached 132 million uh, cases worldwide with 3 million, close to 3 million uh, deaths by the 7th April. And in Africa, as a continent which is less affected according to the, the figures that we have. Uh, we don't know the reasons for, for sure, but we have much less figures in terms of cases and deaths. We have registered so far 3.5 million. It's not African continent as, as, as such. When we take the whole continent of Africa, it, it will exceed 4 million. But the WHO African region, which excludes the northern part of Africa, about seven countries. Uh, we have 3.5 million cases so far, and over 111,000 deaths. The figures look small, 
compared to the other continents. There could be some explanation behind it, but one of the possible explanations could be related to how we capture also the figures and how we do also the aggressively testing our uh, suspected case. All those may have implications, but for now we just report the figures as uh, being low. In general, globally, uh, all over the six blocks of WHO, six regions, all of them have registered an increase, uh, but Africa has registered a decline as a continent. But when you come into individual countries, there is variation. In each uh, block, for example, in Western Africa, we have Benin, Cape Verde, Mali, Togo, Gambia, with an increasing daily cases from the reported number of days, uh, cases. And in Central Africa, Burundi, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Congo, and Gabon have also shown an increase, an increasing trend. In East Africa, Ethiopia, Madagascar, Mauritius, and Rwanda have also shown an increasing trend in number of cases. And in Southern African region, Angola is the only one that registered, you know, in the recent uh, four weeks, an increase in the number of cases. In addition to the number of increasing, the increasing number of uh, cases, what is worrying us is also the new variants of uh, the virus that are spreading. And uh, there are different variants. For the variants that's known as variant of concern 2020-12, uh, uh, slash zero one, 125 countries across all the six regions of WHO have reported cases of such a variant. The variant known as 501Y dot V2, which is, I think, its origin, the first report came from South Africa, and uh, which is also known to be much more aggressive in terms of transmissibility and also possibly the severity of the disease is also uh, has also spread in 75 countries across all the six regions of WHO particularly in Africa also but in Africa there are some spots some countries that have not reported a case but that does not mean that it's a, it's absent some countries don't have the capacity to do the sequencing the testing and they don't have labs, they don't actively test. So why are we concerned about the variant? Because there is an increasing evidence that these new variants are highly transmissible compared to the previous variant. As a result, and in addition, the severity of the illness that they cause, it looks much more serious and more diseases may result as a result. So that's why we're concerned. So with increasing number of cases, with the new variants in, in the picture, although the vaccines have arrived, we are not out of the woods because we have many challenges still to face. But what's encouraging is we have time-proven public health measures that have worked without even the vaccines. Some countries have managed to contain the spread of the disease without the vaccine. You, have, you are familiar with some of the countries who have done that, who have contained the spread. Some may have also completely eliminated, like New Zealand. And some have completely minimized the number of cases, like China, uh, South Korea, and uh, there are also several countries that I don't remember exactly now. But these measures work. You can prevent transmission. You can stop the transmission by doing the basic principles, by applying the basic principles of uh, containing the disease. First is 
are detecting early. You detect early, you identify the keys, isolate the keys, I also identify the contacts and also monitor the contacts. Isolate them and mo monitor them. We call it quarantine, actually, for, for such cases. And if we do that effectively, we can practically stop transmission of the disease. But usually doing that is not easy. Well, there are lots of uh, logistics uh, and uh, human resource challenges and uh, several other things that are needed to make sure that it's effectively done. So sometimes it's constrained by resources, sometimes by technical expertise, plus motivation, commitment, many things will affect all that. So vaccines are very welcome. We have vaccines as additional tools in the momentum of uh, tools that we have to combat this disease. But as we have been saying repeatedly, it's not the only solution. It's not a magic bullet. We have to continue doing the basic public health measures that I have cited earlier. We have to do that. And at individual level, we have to do what we are supposed to do. Wearing the masks that way, like what we do. Keeping distance, washing hands. These are effective if they are applied consistently. It will help us. But the vaccines are also bringing us new hope in containing the disease. So this interaction review is a review to strengthen our preparedness and response system in the country, not only for the COVID-19 pandemic that we are currently facing, but beyond COVID-19. By strengthening our system, we'll be able to detect any future communicable disease pathogen that may be transmissible the same way. And very likely, from the forecasts, we are likely to have another similar pandemic. The pandemic flu is a possibility. Another variety of the virus may also come again. But if we, our systems are tested and, and ready, we can easily detect, contain the spread. So it's not about only COVID-19. It goes beyond. So I would like to emphasize that because what we have done this week is beyond the COVID-19 containment. But first, I would like to actually uh, congratulate you for coming up with all, identifying the problems, exactly what is blocking us from going as we would like to go. And identifying the problem is the first step of really in solving the, any problem. And you have actually designed also some solutions. I would like to quote, you know, some, you know, some uh, people who were before us who had experienced lots of trouble and then come across it, and they have left us some quotations. One says from John Dewey, Dewey which is, okay, a problem well put is half solved. If it's clearly identified, it's easy to solve it. And Albert Einstein said, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I would spend 55 minutes in identifying, thinking about the problem. Why is that problem? Where did it come? I will invest 55 minutes and five minutes on its solution. So it's, the solution will be much easier once we know exactly where, why we are not making progress. So this is very, very important. And we need to act also after we discover the problems and we have the solutions put clearly, but action is very important. And to make sure that our actions are really making a difference, we have to monitor progress also. For, for that, we need to have key indicators in each thematic response areas, like in coordination, surveillance, laboratory, we should have very few 
key indicators that will really help us to monitor the progress. Otherwise, we'll not know where we are. And we have to do that regular gauging of our progress on a quarterly basis, at least, to see where are we. Where did we start? Where are we now? What's left? What's done? If we don't do that, we'll not make much progress. So I would like to emphasize the importance of really having key indicators in each thematic area. I've seen the presentations. You have identified the major problems that are really uh, obstacle to our progress, but we can make progress if we just define uh, it in some indicators. And we are going to develop also a plan uh, today and tomorrow, and we will have at least a plan for 2021. So that will help us to chart the way forward, but also some indicators in that also would be very useful, which will be part of the plan, I hope. And the other thing that all of us should also recognize is that please try to make, to move at least one step every day, a little bit improvement. Even 1% improvement every day can take us very far. 1% improvement. Don't really discount your efforts. So to do that, what I would advise all of us to do is don't wait for others to change everything. Do your share. Do what you can within your ability, within your means. Then ask for help for the extra. But never really rely on external things. Usually we tend to blame, oh, I, I didn't get this one, I was not given this, I was not supported on this. That will help us, you know, to make excuses. But if you want to make a real change, we have to really do little at our level. Whatever level we are, whether we are dealing with data, whether we are dealing with a laboratory, try to make a small improvement, a small change to the, positive, to the right, right direction every day. If we do that, together we'll make a big difference. All those drops together, I usually use the, you know, the bucket and uh, a tap. If you leave a bucket with a drop from the tap, just once in five minutes, if you come in the morning, the bucket will be full. It's just like that. Anything that we do, small drops, will make a big change. So I would like just to really take every contribution that we can make seriously and do whatever we can to change the situation. Uh, thank you so much, uh, LR, Dr. Desta, uh, for that uh, detailed information delivered here today. And interestingly, we also like the quotes that have been also presented here today. And we also want to thank you also, you and your team, for the support to the health sector. I now invite the permanent secretary uh, to give a statement. And I think uh, in consultation with uh, PS, uh, JJ, uh, Doc, Mr. Dunfa has been assigned to deliver the statement. P.S. Dunfa, kindly come forward to give this I want to <coughs> recognize the presence of the Honorable Minister, Dr. Samate, Double uh, R, and also the, the, the coordinator, our, our <coughs> the COVID coordinator, the Dr. Sam and my colleague, P.S. Jaita. I also want to recognize the presence of Dr. Dr. Bide, the Director of Health Services, who has been very helpful in the whole entire process, he has been coming in and out. I know it, that was because of his busy schedule. He could not stay with us throughout. I also want to recognize uh, Ifane and the team. I think they have also been very, very supportive. They have been with us here throughout these five days. I also want to uh, thank and also recognize the efforts of our directors of, and also the various team leads and their committees. You know, they have been very, very hardworking throughout uh, these five days. And 
We also want to thank the, uh, the other partners that has been, although they are not here with us as uh, Dr. Desta mentioned it, but they have, been, they have also been very helpful in supporting the response. And all those who have contributed in one way or the other, and not only supporting this uh, review, but also the entire process of the response since the beginning of COVID. I think <clears throat> we have to recognize that uh, without this collective effort, we will not be able to get to this level. It's going to be extremely difficult for us to manage this kind of emergency without each and every one of us contributing. Then we have to recognize that contribution. I think that is very important. And also it is natural that when you have a plan in managing whether, it, whether, whether it's an emergency or not, at some point you need to sit down and review that plan and see what works and what doesn't work. I think this five days review is all about that. For us to come together and see what works and what is not working or what are not working and see how we can adjust the plan to be able to respond more effectively to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to COVID. But as uh, Dr. Destos mentioned, this is not only about enhancing our ability to manage COVID, but it's also to ensure that we have the necessary structures, you know, well prepared to, to, to deal with any emergency that, they, that, that may emerge even beyond COVID. Because without getting ourselves prepared, we will not be able to deal with the future emergencies. Then it is not only about you know dealing with COVID, but it's also about you know putting in structures, systems that can help us to be able to deal with any emergency that may emerge, you know, beyond COVID. I think that is very important. There are a few lessons that uh, we have learned in this uh, in this entire process. For me, there are a few things. One is the willingness and the commitment of the people. D during these five days, we have very committed team that have stayed with us throughout and, have, and uh, de they have devoted their time and, and, and efforts to ensure that, you know, we are able to have uh, this draft that was presented by Dr. Bitte and also the willingness of the leadership you know, that has been always been around to guide the teams. I think our minister, you know, has been providing that leadership from the beginning and has always, has always been available to provide, you know, the kind of leaderships that uh, the teams are always, you know, required. I think that's something, you know, that's very impressive and we, have, and we want to thank him, Dr. Samate, I think he has, he has been very, very helpful. And, 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 and at every level, you could see the commitment <laughs> that he has to play his part and lead the process. And also the commitment from the government. Because <clears throat> we all recognize that after the, uh, the, the moment, you know, we had this outbreak, government quickly made about 500 million Dallas is available without any waste of time. If you don't have a, a commit, if you don't have that kind of commitment, you find it very difficult to be able to reorganize yourself and be able to deal with uh, this kind of emergencies. And I think that is something that uh, you know we have to recognize and also commend the government for for, for that kind of uh, commitment and willingness that they have shown from the beginning. I think that is very, very important. And we want to thank the president to, 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 through the Minister of Health. I think that's, that's something that uh, we want to do. The, 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 the other things that uh, we have to also recognize at the senior management, although we have challenges, and that is natural, you know, this kind of, in this kind of situation, you know, you are bound to have challenges, 
and even not uh, in the state of emergency, in, in any situation, you know, you have you, you must have some challenges. But we could see the willingness on the part of the senior management in, 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 in terms of resp uh, in supporting the response. The doors of the senior management have always been open and will continue to be open. And we have to thank PSJ for, 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 for that leadership since it's the, is, 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 is the team lead of the senior management. I also want to thank the, want to have a special, I want to extend our special thanks to WHO, not only in, 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 in supporting this workshop, but also making their expertise available at every time in ensuring that uh, we are able to manage the response more effectively. We also want to thank Dr. Sam, that's the, that's the, uh, the World Bank expert that has always, always been with us. Dr. 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 Sam is now a Gambian. He has been here for a while and has been very, very, he has been very, very helpful. You know, he's always willing to support us and, and, and he's somebody who is very approachable. I have worked with a number of uh, t t TTLs in the past, you know, on, on, on with different uh, World Bank projects. But I, Dr. Sam is different, you know, somebody who is always willing to support, you know, is always willing even to contribute ideas, you know, it even goes beyond the role that he's supposed to play just to give you a broader advice. I think that is something that we need to recognize. I think that is very important. That is very difficult to get, you know, if, if you have experience with some of the TDLs that, you know, we had in the past. Then I also want to thank the rest of the, uh, the participants that have spent uh, these five days here in, you know, in being with us. But I don't want to end without recognizing my team, that is Hadi, Fatu, and Aisha. Anytime I step out, they will call me and say, P.S. Denver, we need you here. You have to come and join us. I said, okay, I'll come. This, this, and, and, and I think they have been very, very helpful and they are very active. They have devoted a lot of their time, you know, even, even today when some of them supposed to be at home cooking for their husband, but they decided to say, you know, we have to be here. <laughs> if I, one of them asked me, he said, are you coming tomorrow? I, I said, yes, because my boss is coming. It's, it's because the minister is coming, who is my boss, then I have to be here. She also said, okay, I'll also come because my boss is coming. I said, who is your boy? He said, P.S. Denver. Then I'll also be here. I said, okay, then it's good that, <laughs> that we, should all, we should all come. And, and try to complete this this plan. I think that is uh, that's 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 a clear demonstration of commitments that that they have, you know, and and, and that's something that we need to recognize. Then I want to thank everyone. I don't want to uh, to bore you with a lot of statements. I just want to thank all of you, and let's continue the commitment. Let's ensure that uh, we don't only identify problems, but let, let us also try to implement the recommendations you know, in, so that we can deal with those problems. As, as, as Dr. Dester said, if you identify a problem, have it solved. In economic policy management, we say the first point is, is to be able to identify a problem. If we identify a problem, we, you should be able to solve it. In, in, and also at the second level, the reason why we, uh, we always review our plans and, 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 and I'm trying to re-strategize is, is simply because we don't have a perfect system. It's, it's simply because we are not perfect. There is a famous economist who said, there is no perfect system, then the only thing that the society can strive for is to have the second best. The second best, and you cannot have second best if you, don't, if you are not reviewing, continuously reviewing yourself. You know, and be able to react, you know, to, 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 to the weaknesses that we've identified, you know, to the, uh, to the good ideas that, they, that, that, that we may come across. And, and I think this review has helped us to be able to share ideas, to be able to ensure that, you know, we learn lessons, 
and also prepare ourselves better, and not only for COVID, but for the future. I thank you all. We are now going to move towards the end. Uh, I will now invite someone who will give a vote of thanks on behalf of all the participants. But this is someone who is also about to leave us. He has worked uh, throughout the entire, the entire part of his life, about 37 years for the health sector. And then he is almost retiring. And before he retires, we want him to make a statement. Uh, and giving the word of thanks, as at least we will not say his last statement, but at least we will always remember him of that statement. And I'm sure when he makes his last, I mean, last words, sometimes he always say a word that we also want to hear later, uh, which is the very famous, uh, pro, I mean, normally statement he normally gives us a timpa timpa, am I right? So I know this, uh, this person is no other person other than Ali Abuaka Sambu, the regional director of West Coast Region 2, who will give the word of thanks. Ali, welcome. Honorable Minister, my dear brother, Dr. Ahmed Lamin Samate, WR, Dr. Desta, National COVID Coordinator, of course, my dear brother, Mr. Yaya Sanya, Okarabo Sanya, Dr. Sam of the World Bank, my two PSs, PSJT and PS Damfa. Dr. Mustafa Bite, the Director of Health Services, the WHO Technical Assistants, Dr. Ifani and his team, my colleague Regional Directors, and also my other colleagues from the Ministry of Health, including the Director of Health Promotion and Education, the UN System Representatives here, UNICEF, WHO, and others, IOM, the Gambia Red Cross Society, representative from the Gambia Armed Forces, the press, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, I say good afternoon. I think we are now in the afternoon. Uh, as uh, Dr. Uh, Modinjai rightly said, in my last moments of my active service, of course, I feel so sad but also very happy that I worked for 35 years, not wanting till the end. I feel very much happy to be given the opportunity by the Minister of Health, right down from the senior management, to, to allow me to be executing my roles and responsibilities because I started work in 1984 as a staff nurse up to as a midwife and all others, then I went into management. Indeed, I'm very much uh, glad that I have reached this stage. But of course also, we started this COVID together and throughout, I am with you. I am very much happy to be part of, associated with this interaction review on COVID-19. And of course, we have contributed, all of us, we have contributed and some of the issues challenges and even achievements and best practices uh, presented here by Dr. Bitte, of course, shows that, of course, we as Gambians and our partners are indeed uh, committed to the eradication of COVID-19 in this country and all other countries in, of the world. Uh, my last statement, some say life is an ice cream that you should enjoy it before it melts. And that is regarded as selfless, selfless or selfish enjoyment. Some say life is an ice cream that is, you should enjoy it before it melts. And that's true, ice cream, that is the principle. But indeed, in another arm, some say life is like a candle. It gives light before it melts away. And that is true. One should bring light to others before you leave the stage. And of course, I believe my life agenda was to contribute to that small drop of light or light that I give before I die. Because Dobara said, if we put a bucket here in the morning and it drops, 
one by one, one by one. By the morning, it will be full. I hope, and I very much hope, and convinced people who know me, whom I work very, very well with, will believe and trust that, attest to the fact that, of course, I have contributed to one, at least one gleam of light, of course, to my country. This is what I believe. But you see, you to attest to that. On that note, I thank you very much. May God continue to bless all of us. Thank you. We are moving on to the last item on the agenda, which is the closing statement to be delivered by the Honorable Minister. I want to again recognize the presence of our able sister, the, the FAO country representative sitting in right in front of us. Ma, we want to recognize her presence and thank you for all the support. Now, Honorable, you can kindly come forward to come and give your closing statement. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Sanjay, for sharing the occasion and all your input. We start by saying timpa timpa to Mr. Ngali Abuakar Song. Sambu. Uh, of course, we are going to miss you a whole lot, but I'm sure you will continue to be around with us. 35 years of active service is not a joke of commitment to the people of this country. Uh, but you should be assured that the people appreciate your input, the ministry appreciates your input, and certainly I keep on saying, unfortunately, people retire when they have acquired all the knowledge and the experience, and that is when they go. Yes, people must continue with other aspects of their life, they need to rest, but this is the reality of life. But the important thing is what one was able to leave behind with that knowledge and experience. The impact and then the capacity one would have built uh, for replacement because that's good leadership. Good leaders leave a legacy. They train people who could fit into their shoes any point in time. And we know you've been doing that. We're going to miss all the humor, but really, we are looking forward to continue having you around. Thank you very much. Yeah. Inshallah, we'll have another opportunity to thank you better. Thank you. The permanent secretaries of the Ministry of Health, Mr. J.T. and uh, Mr. Damfa, the WHO country representative, Dr. Dexter Turuni, the World Bank task team leader, Dr. Saab Mills, the FAO uh, country representative, Madam, excuse me, I've not uh, learned your name yet, but I'll get to know after the meeting. I'll get to be reminded, I, I, I would have known it. The COVID-19 coordinator, Mr. Yaya Sanya, the director of health services, Dr. Mustafa Bijay, all the regional directors here present and their team members, the representatives of our other partners, UNICEF, UNDP, WHO, World Food Program, FAO, IOM, UNDP, the security forces, Dalbag, and all the other people who have been contributing in one way or the other to the success of this response. Certainly, it couldn't have gone this way without all your participation and your input. We say good morning to you all. We start by apologizing for the start commencement. Our idea was, as mentioned earlier, to come and participate in the workshop and then at the end of it, give a statement. We didn't know the commencement of today's activities really needed our presence. We apologize for, for that. We are once again delighted to stand in front of you to participate in this intra-action review meeting. This is a very, very important meeting because we have started an activity and we, are, we continue to go along and continue to go. But we needed to take a break and look at what has transpired. 
are we actually going the right way or do we need to bend here or bend there so that we have a very successful response. When the WR mentioned this to me a couple of months ago, and uh, as part of our regular briefing meetings, I bought into the idea, and I said to him, I think this is a brilliant idea, that we look at what has transpired. Because it's certainly better to know what we have done, to know where we have made mistakes, if any, to know the successes, and to actually know the way forward. It is certainly better to get it done now and to do it after the response. We get to know what the problems were and we say to ourselves, oh, that was a problem. We wish we had known earlier. We wish we had done it this way or that way. Let us know in good time and we do it the right way so that the response can be of uh, better success. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, certainly we acknowledge the men and women of the media who have been there throughout, throughout, come rain, come shine, and their contribution certainly has been immense. Apologies for not having acknowledged your presence earlier on. We also want to say we have come a long way in the COVID-19 response. Fortunately or unfortunately, no country had ever responded to COVID-19 before. So we all did it together. We all learned together. So in that, I believe anecdotally, I can say that the country response has been a success. And I thank you all. Of course, WR, I will, uh, I will, I will quickly uh, I will quickly uh, have a little bit of a different opinion on some of the ideas. In that, if things work better, if things work well in Australia and New Zealand, they say it's a robust system they did very well. If things work better in Africa, they say it's because of the demography, it's because they are not getting the numbers, it's because they are not doing this, they are not doing that. So we should also say probably things actually got better in Africa because our people did well. And that's my opinion. Because we did something. And that something would have yielded some results. And if those results are good, that means that our something what, in a way? Of course, not, none of this is possible without the help of the Almighty Allah. But we actually recognize the importance of breaking the chain of transmission. And we, did, we, we took steps to ensure that. We, our quarantine regime was very robust, though there were lapses here and there. But there was a time we were taking air, almost everybody to the hotels. We closed the borders. We, we had a state of emergencies. We had curfews. Yes, people don't put on the mask regularly. But there was a time people were washing their hands. So at least we did something we believe contributed to where we are today. And we thank you because it is you who, who are doing it. Now, we are happy, we thank uh, Dr. Musafa Bite for that uh, brilliant presentation and all of you for your input. But I think what has been very pivotal in our response is the openness and the transparency. I think SAWAS has been one of the most transparent processes in the sense that as you discuss the challenges, you are open to even media scrutiny and reporting. Your CITREP, our CITREP, has been on the media. Everybody had access to that. Even though, unfortunately, sometimes they pick one or two operational uh, points 
and uh, make it a news item. We shouldn't be. But anyway, people had access to know the inner work workings of the COVID response activities. Now, that same transparency continued here, where you have, I believe, what looked like a peer review meeting, where you could, you could look at the details, probably nicely criticizing each other and nicely complaining about what the other is not doing to make your own work easy. But I think that frankness is very important, otherwise we will not make progress. We are also interdependent. If you look at all the thematic areas, all of them are intertwined in such a way that if one is not functional, the other will certainly not be functional, or the achievements of the other will not be realized. So that frankness is very important. One very important point that came out was actually uh, the resource issues and resources getting to uh, the disbursement and so on and so forth. I think that's very important because quite a lot of the activities uh, needed resources for the actual implementation. But of course, people are also mindful that it is a pandemic, it is, it is a response, but certainly nobody wanted resources to be abused. So the safeguards had to be there. The accountability mechanisms had to be there. So I think one important thing is to have a very robust accountability mechanism in our systems that is ensured by very stringent monitoring that will build trust in our systems. And believe me, with that kind of trust and accountability mechanism and a monitoring mechanism, government and partners will be very willing to release funds as and when they are requested. When funds are released, we have to make sure they go where they are supposed to go in a timely fashion. We implement quickly, and we also retire those funds quickly. And then we have a team that monitor, monitors that and ensures that. These are just some of my suggestions because we've seen points that yes, it should be enhanced. But otherwise, it will stay in your report that it should be enhanced if we don't have a mechanism of how should it be enhanced. Who is responsible for that enhancement? the implementation of that enhancement. Otherwise, quite a number of your recommendations may just stay in the report. But these are the, 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 the actual way of achieving these goals should be outlined. And who is responsible for what should be outlined. In addition to that, who makes sure that the person responsible does what he or she should do? So we have to also strengthen that. Because if you look at our systems, our systems certainly have every item, there's someone responsible for that item. But who makes sure that the person responsible has done what he's supposed to do? I think we have to have that strong system. Otherwise, they'll, be continu they'll continue to be gaps uh, here and there. One unfortunate th thing also is that Yes, uh, it's, uh, it's an emergency time. Procurement rules have to be followed. Procurement processes are sometimes slow, but the rules unfortunately have to be followed. Uh, it comes to the same idea of having a robust accountable system because in as much as people are doing very well behind the scenes, but the rules don't uh, trust anybody. They just trust the, pro the, the steps. If people follow the steps, the rules say, yes, you have done well. If people don't follow the steps, the rules do not care who the person is, really. Those are the rules. So that is why the rules need to be followed. But it can be expedited. I think one challenge we have as a country is have a specialized medical and related products procurement unit. We don't have that, and that is a big challenge. So a lot of times, the items we actually need, it is you, the same technical people, 
who even spend your valuable time, instead of participating in other aspects of the response, you spend your valuable time to actually guide the procurement officers. And it goes back and forth, because the procurement officer has never heard of a ventilator. He tells you what is this. Then you explain to him. You try to help him get these specifications. You try, so it is a very, very tedious process. So as a country, I think one gap that I have seen is to have a highly specialized medical and allied products procurement unit that know what is needed. They know that there are 50 types of ventilators. They know the specifications of ventilators. They can advise the technical people. This ventilator is better than that. This one has this advantage. This one has that. That will fast in, fast track the procurement process. Then you can say, yes, this is what we want. And they are the ones now who will be working with your procurement team or the rest of the people involved in the procurement, and you focus on doing the response. But a lot of time is spent on these things, and this is a big gap I think uh, I have realized uh, in, in, in slowing the processes in this country. Another challenge too, which probably came in various forms, uh, in the, is that I think we have too many meetings. Our meetings are too many. We meet every morning, afternoon, night, too many meetings. We need to reduce meetings. And then at least reduce the duration of the meetings. A meeting that can take one hour ends up taking three hours. We come and talk, 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 talk. It's very good to, to, to have everybody on board. But let us shorten it. Sometimes the meetings go like this. Dr. Samade say, or somebody says something, which is good. Yes, it's good. Let's move on. But Dr. Samade will come and say, oh, I agree with what he has said. And I repeat all what the other person has said. Another person comes after me. In fact, as the previous speakers have said, I agree. And he also repeats all what we have all said. So that makes the meeting very long. So before you know it, the whole day is spent. The actual activity is not done. And the follow-up of what we discuss in the meetings, somebody has to be responsible for that follow-up. Because you realize that certain items have continued to appear in the minutes of the meetings for one month, two months, the same thing. Because it cannot be expunged, because no action has been taken on that particular item. That is not good. So we have to have a system whereby People are assigned responsibilities, and they have a reporting mechanism. So I think part of the response too is, I don't know which unit uh, could also be made responsible for the follow-up of action points to make sure what is assigned to Mr. A, he does it, and if he doesn't do it, what? Because that's the point. Sometimes we are supposed to do something, we don't do it, and we kept on being reminded, we don't do it. We kept on being reminded. And uh, we, we, we never did those things. And what happens? So there has to be, even though it is a response. But I, I believe one other aspect that we could have within it is an appraisal system. Let's appraise each other. Let's have a system whereby tasks given to us, somebody appraises whether we do them at all or we do them on time. Without that, certain things will continue to be delayed and delayed and delayed. So these are some of the things. I'm sure you have discussed them in detail. Uh, but uh, really, I think uh, you have all done extremely, extremely well. A uh, few days ago, I had an interview with uh, uh, one journalist, Gambian, based somewhere. Uh, he was talking about quite a number of issues. And I said, I think what we deserve, the response team, is actually commendations. Yes, there are challenges, but gather courage, and people should gather courage and commend the response team, because we have done quite well. And you all need a big round of applause. Yes, when we talk, we say we have done better than some countries. Some people think, well, what do you expect the health ministers to say? But I think sometimes we allow, we allow other countries, uh, other people, observers to do that. But I say to him, at least a lot of people are running from other places, parts of the world, to come to Gambia. 
and some have come to Gambia and refused to go back to wherever they came from. So that shows that Gambia is offering something or something is different in Gambia. And uh, so I think that alone is justification to thank the response team. Uh, before I finally conclude, I think we should take the outcome of this uh, meeting very, very seriously because it should not be a futile uh, exercise, uh, just identifying the problems, as mentioned earlier by the WR, identification of the problem is a very significant part of the solution already. So now that we have identified what the challenges are, I think we should also proffer possible solutions, and we should also have a mechanism whereby those solutions are uh, implemented. So the, 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 we probably should have a checklist uh, of uh, the variables that need to be taken care of, the indicators that need to be put in place, and we ensure, and we have a reporting mechanism. I think probably someone should be tasked to coordinate what is going to happen with regards to uh, this, uh, this, this, this report that we are going to get. Otherwise, three months down the line, we will come and realize that certain things are where we left it, and it, it wouldn't be useful. So once again, I wish to thank you all. It had been a very, very difficult period. Uh, COVID-19 period is uh, a very unusual period for humanity. Uh, we typically say, Ministry of Health work itself, all the aspects, the, the central level, the regional levels, the technical areas, the hospitals, is not an easy task. Running a health system is not an easy task, especially with resource limitations here and there, capacity limitations. And COVID came to be added on top of that. And with COVID, the entire population is worried about COVID, but they are not managing the response. They are not participating in the response. They probably are just worried about their own health and the health of their relatives. But we say for the health workers and all the people participating in the response, we also have those same worries as the population about our own health, about the health of our relatives and friends and all the, all the members, all the people in this country. But we have to have the, or we have the extra burden of dealing with the response, dealing with the welfare of the entire population. So it's not an easy task. But uh, please continue what you are doing. Uh, in a very, in an extra robust form, You've been, you are all doing very well already, uh, but we can still do better. There is a lot of room for improvement. Uh, we want to thank you all for your continuous sacrifice, uh, immense hard work, and uh, for the love of humanity and wanting to do the best for humanity. And at this juncture, I would like to uh, Madam, they, they mentioned, uh, they, they gave me a note uh, that uh, uh, has given me your name now, but I'll call you after the meeting, after the closing ceremony. Uh, at this juncture, would like to uh, happily declare this review meeting closed. Thank you very much. Dengbuga wa askanbi ne COVID-19 lu amla. First of all, nyu hamne lu amla. Paski e luta nyu wara bany ne COVID-19 defa am. Gomne ne malaria amna. 
gom nañ ni euh diabetes amna xana dañ musa gis diabetes dañ musa gis malaria musuñ ko gis won te ñu ne amna ñu gom ko ku febar ku subiru mu dem ga jox ko ñu test ko ñu jox ko garam fresh call tamit amna lana de cause fresh call lu bari ay virus yi ni la covid 19 tamit virus la won de buñ jeka bi ñu ngi doon degane pneumonia sa amna bente pneumonia amna covid 19 virus la doomi jangora la bo xamne defa tax niti am pneumonia bu garaw so luta niti wara wax ne covid 19 amut hmm amna ño xamne dañ ci de buga dañ ci de buga dañ ko ci de buga dugal ci ay waxi say say tuti e covid amut bu ñu gaay sonal ci waxi say say lap comme lu ño buga foyantu so ñeneni suñ dege lolu ñuy la na gom dañu lor niti covid 19 lu am la amna ñuko am fuñ taxaw ni amna ñu nekk ci l'hôpital ñu ñu la na fay ci covid 19 amna ño xamne dañ ci faatu covid 19 lañ am té lo xamne def de reey nit lolu war nañ ci taxaw lolu dafa serious té ñu né jafé wut nonu fum nekk ni ñu né at least ñuy raxa suñ loxoy suñ aada bi suñ diina bi xana sandu pour ñu sét suñ bu galé ka lan lañ dé def duñ dé raxas loxo luta ñu wara raxas loxo suñu lé ka parce que loxo bi def dé mëna am jangoro so jangoro bobu suñu raxas loxo légué légué ci lim buñ dé gis bu dé gëna ñun sax dañ ko dé gis su dé raxasuñ loxo ñu ngi dox ci bir dëkk bi ñu duggal suñ baram bobu hmm ci suñ botti mën nañ fa def jangoro mota ñu né loxo yi sét ku def tuti kané ci baram bi raxasut ko su duggalé loxo bi ci bot bi lan la dé def def dé la ka so jangoro bi tamit su lalé loxo bi ñu duggal ko suñ loxo bi ci bir bot bi dafa dina mëna duggal ci suñ système bi so façon yoyu la mota ñu né ñuy raxas loxo ñuy jël sanitizer den ñu né tamit ñuy sol masque mas bi dafa am solo gaay gis nañ ne mas mas bi def de mëna ar niti lo xamne ñu ne si nit saxate su nit solo si la de gëna mëna tasaro té ñun xam nañ ne su nit solo suñ bor lan lañ de def suñ moy tout tuf li lal ma ñu ndax du suñ defé mas ci solo bi dina ñu mëna lal da fa jafé so lolu suñ sété common sense bi sax xamné né sol mas bi baxna suñu wax sax xana légué légui ni ñu nekk di wax sax toufli di génn mu dem dal ci kenen so suñ solé mas toufli bobu dina génn du génn so amna solo ci ñun kuko sol kenen tamit kuko sol di nga gis né suñ nokki façon yoyo duñ mëna dugg ci mom def ko mëna ar ci ndimbal yalla so li mo tax ñu né ñuy sol masque be paré tamit ñu né ñuy sori wanté febar bo xamné de de ci di walanté su kéna amé kénen mën na ko am ku ko am so ko sori di ngi ko mëna am té fa jafé so luñ ci lu ñoo wax yépp common sense sax wax na né lolu dina ñu dimbalé té bép paré déka yo xamné def nañ yu mala wax li ñom sen covid cases yi bari won so gambia tamit ñun tamit ñu try pour covid ci ndimbal yalla covid 19 gëna ci déka bi ñu mëna délo fuñ melon ñu mëna def suñ gënté yi ñuy mëna socialize ñuy mëna dem ziaré wanté ñuy mëna def luñ bëgga def so fok ñu try légui pour covid dem pour ñu mëna délo fuñ nekkon so response plan bi next step bi moy ñun yépp ñu sét ci process bi lu suñ gaay gis fo xamé né suñ liggéey bi amna ci doole ñuy yokku fofu nonu 
on ñu dégral ko on ñu tiyé ko ak suñu ñaari loxo fo xamné tamit amna téha téha ñu try yokako pour mu gëna am doolé pour dimbalé suñu response bi pour ñu mëna def luñu wara def okay Wow, financial challenges euh lu ci nek moy euh lu gaay wax légué légui euh suñ suñ soxlé dara euh def dé jël time bala mu ñew luma ci wax moy waaw wonté suñ soxlé dara fo mu jaré yoon luñ la jox so koy so koy yus ci lo xamné dafa jaré yoon dafa jaré système ñu la ko jox ñuy check né luñ la ko joxé fofu la jaré yo nga bind kayt yi won len né lu ngeen ma jox ni lañ ko def pour ñu joxat la dafa yomba so motax mané ñu dégaral fofu lo xamné central level bi jox naka ño xamné ñoko dé jëfo ñu make sure fu mu wara dem fofu la dem ñu make sure accountability am ñu make sure ñu binda né fi la dem ñu make sure ñeneen yi ku ko wara check ku wara confirm né dem na fu mu wara duga koku tamit confirm dina gëna yoka confidence bi dina gëna tax suñu soxlé dara ñu leen wara jox ñu tel la na jox parce que nañ xamné fu mu wara dem fofu la dé dem nekkut né amna kuy def lo xamné waru sa am no won de fok kenen set lu wara def lolu la mo def lolu la don degeral so suñ monitoring system bi suñ system bu wara check confirm ne lu ku neka lu mo def mu ko def system bobu la buga bu gëna strong a senegal a gambia comme comme nuñ ko waxe a ñun ñun yeb mbokale ba pare uh, gambians uh, yu bari amnañ ay mboka senegal senegal yu bari amnañ ay mboka fi so travel bi ñu dé duga gena digante gambia senegal bari nañ bes bu neka té amna dé ka yo xamné euh euh ci boda bi lañ neka ha bobu gay légué légué senegal lañ dé duga jënd dara ci boutique bi wala ñu neka senegal gambia lañ dé duga pour jënd dara ci boutique bi so lolu euh so bena dé ka ci ñun so am a problem jehagut bon benen de kabidak na pare so mota fog defandor suñ response bi gay ñu ngi def sen boss ñun ñu ngi def suñ boss wonte dañ dé am ay meeting nañ dé communicate uh, response team bi senegal sen jit bi ñew na fi ay yoon bu mu joggé fi yagut sax pour def meeting ak suñ gay amna suñ yena senegal uh, senegal uh, team bi bu fi ñew a uh, pour set ak suñ gaay naka la ñu uh, gëna digëral loolu ñu liggé andor euh def nañ fi ay training tamit suñ gaay euh den amna suñ gaay tamit ñu ñu dem fofu the same thing so ñu ngi collaborate ak senegal bu baaxaba ba paré tamit uh, suñ jiti suñ president bi ak president senegal dañ ci dé waxtaan uh, def nañ ay liggé bu bari bari pour dimbalé uh, liggé kat yi ci ñaari dëkkay euh naka lañ muné euh def responsable ba paré tamit bu yagu rega nga tamit senegal mu ñu doné ta ay vaccine vaccine yoyu tamit ñew nañ so ñu ngi collaborate bu baaxa ba ci mbiru faji affaire covid bi ak dañ daan def lolu ci affaire malaria ak affaire tuberculosis ak yene ak yene yes niti ñu ngi ko use amna solo tor legge legi amna ñu ci dé complain né suñ ko kolé duñ ko dé téla am wonte ñu ngi improve lolu every time xam nga so amé service bu nek so ko amé su niti amé téha téha suñ koy wax di nga gis né ñun tamit dinañ ci mëna improve wonte mu ngi dimbalé niti amna ñu bari ño xamné information buñ am ci affaire covid ci 1025 bi la nek fofu lañ ko jëlé so 1025 bi amna solo té ñu ko xam ci biir dëkka bi légui bari nañ torop so wonte su ci niti amé ay jafé jafé né ñu koy yégal pour ñu def improvement so ñu ngi try pour def constant improvement si system thank you um, so much i think uh, this is what we call intra action review 
So what this means is, uh, you know, uh, since from March last year, 2020, we've been, uh, you know, responding to the COVID-19 pandemic in the country. And uh, it has been a long journey. Um, the whole of 2020, you know, we have not been, you know, back to normal due to the outbreak. And uh, the Minister of Health has activated what we call COVID-19 response plan. Um, with partners and of course all the government you know institutions were all involved so uh, after activating this response plan um, um, various pillars have been also activated this includes um, the coordination pillar of the response also include the surveillance case management laboratory risk communication and community engagement psychosocial research among others so these are pillars within the response and they have uh, we have men who have been very, very much supportive and active over the year, responding to um, the outbreak based on their pillar. So we feel at some point the COVID response is still going on. Um, we could have after action review when the pandemic is over. But before then, you know, we need to assess ourselves at some point and see how best are we doing, what are some of the areas that need improvement and uh, the areas that uh, we have um, strengths and uh, after identifying those um, areas, uh, weakness areas, then we should um, come up with um, a way forward, a recommendation, action plan to say, okay, this is how we want to go about it now. So the whole idea of this meeting is geared towards that, to see how best we can respond more effectively to the virus, to the, to the pandemic, um, as we go along in 2021. A lot of a lot of achievements have emanated from the hall here. Uh, to uh, from you know these four days, um, we have seen a lot of best practices that have taken place over the year. Um, key among them is the effective coordination of these uh, whole response intervention. There were a very good coordination, um, ranging from partner coordination to interministerial coordination, and in fact, you know between. Uh, the government and the communities, the civil society. Uh, that was a very good, um, you know, um, strength that we have. And also uh, political leadership, commitment from the political leadership was also something that has been seen and it's also a very big strength for us in the response. We have seen government, you know, from the world go, they have come up with a pledge and they have disbursed funds towards the response, you know, you heard about the 500 million dollars. So all these things were a very important strength that we have. And also, you know, infrastructural wise, you know, and capacity building, a lot of, you know, people were trained and hired to do the services uh, as it required. Um, this, you know, is also a very big strength. We have the manpower to respond to the, though it might not be adequate as we want, but at least we have, uh, you know, uh, acquired something at the end of the day. Um, we have the manpower to, you know, do testing here in the country. We have the manpower to um, treat people uh, with COVID-19, and we have the manpower to do active case search contact tracing, risk communication. So those ones were very, very good um, uh, strengths that we have, you know, seen over the years. You know, and a host of other things, you know, that um, we have seen donors' commitment, support towards the response, um, you know, leading to establishment of uh, treatment centers, establishment of quarantine centers, establishment of isolation centers. These were all big uh, you know, achievements for the ministry. Yeah. Yeah, so um, like any other country, you know, we cannot have 100% perfect system. We know our system, there are some loopholes, which we really need to work on, you know, this, come this 2021. Uh, key among them is logistics. Um, we need medical and medical consumables. Um, both um, medical and even non-medical consumables um, in this response. Uh, we have, you know, got a lot of support um, last year, but this year also we need even a bigger support because um, our system is not, as I said, 100% perfect. So these, uh, we know we need an oxygen plant in the, system, in, the, in the country. Yeah, so that, you know, if people need oxygen, you know, they will be easily, you know, be provided with and then, you know, their lives will be safe. So this is just an example of the medical consumables. But, um, you know, in addition to that, we know we have um, challenges in terms of laboratory consumables as well. 
um, our testing capacity was kind of limited because we don't have enough you know test kits for instance to do uh, a lot of testing so in this area we will also um, need support our system need to be strengthened as well uh, we know the, um, uh, the, the, the the health facilities the hospitals you know need to be uh, upgraded and they need to be renovated and you know more centers need to be built these are things that we definitely need and when it comes to rich communication um, area community engagement we know we have made tremendous efforts you know in sharing information in sensitizing the people but again we need a lot of support in that area to come this um, year, year 2021 in the area of making you know, having resources to have more engagement with the public to have resources to have more engagement with the media we need to strengthen the capacity of the community so that they can respond effectively in their own community because at that level that's where they can do very very well so they need to set up their own systems in the community they have their own surveillance system with what we call community-based surveillance and they need to do a lot to make sure the system works and then uh, together we will um, win the battle so this uh, you know and research also you know the whole of last year as far as I know there are only few research that have been conducted you know here in, in, the, in this area and we need a lot of research so uh, we need to commit a lot of money because research costs a lot of money a lot of money in research to make sure you know we have evidence based you know um, you know uh, approach towards the, uh, the, the, the the pandemic so as we respond to the pandemic it has to be guided by the evidence so these are areas um, and capacity building also we need to train our staffs you know, yes, we have few trained staffs, you know, but, you know, we definitely need a lot of, as I said, you know, we have the manpower, but training in specialized areas is also very important. We need to have, you know, people trained in infectious disease prevention and control. We need to have people trained in laboratory services. We need to have people trained in case management, in burial, safe and dignified burial. We need to have people trained on risk communication and community engagement, um, among others. Yep. It's important, it's very, very important because at the end of the day, we have uh, what we call um, um, resource mobilization. And we actually need resources because, you know, all what I've said, you know, as challenges, without resources, you cannot move forward. So this is why we are having this meeting and we have seen, you know, a lot of, you know, development partners here, donor agencies in this in our midst, and they have seen our recommendation. So we believe uh, once this report is out, it's going to be shared with all, you know, all, our, all of our partners who are involved in this uh, response. And we are going to mobilize a lot of resources because this is very very important um, for us to uh, mobilize resources so that uh, we can have what we want at the end of the day so we are going to do a lot of resource mobilization but of course we uh, um, we are anticipating for government commitment to continue uh, yeah there was strong commitment but you know we need you know more um, funds to uh, do a lot of things that we want and at the end of the day we will defeat uh, COVID-19 in the country yeah. So um, since from last year, uh, there is what we call um, National Multisectoral Committee, uh, Health Emergency Committee that has been set up. And this doesn't only include government institutions, but even non-government institutions as far as to the CSOs, civil society organizations, and even some of the representatives of the community-based organizations. We have seen a very effective engagement with the local government authorities who represent the people at their local level and the National Assembly as well. So we can say, yes, the people are fully involved from the word go. Um, you know, uh, periodically, National Assembly will in fact come and assess us. And we also go to the National Assembly to make presentations as far as the response is concerned. And they will tell us what the people think that should be done, and we put it into the system. So we are definitely going by what people are saying. Okay, so is it right to say that the people are involved, but are indirectly involved because they have people speaking for them or telling you what the pe you, they think the people need, and you're doing that? Both. They are directly involved and some, sometimes they are indirectly involved. So directly involved, yes, because this, uh, these people who are speaking on behalf of, you know, we cannot have each and every two million uh, plus Gambian seat in our midst to decide together. That's no, no country can do that. It's practically impossible. You need to have representatives. So those representatives are the ones who are between us and the grassroots level. So um, 
along after that also we also have engagement you know our risk communication and community engagement has been very active working with the people at the grassroots level so we know their views we know their concerns we know their comments and they are all, 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 always taken on board so we are directly working with the people as well okay so as far as um, the response plan is concerned what is the next step what are the people uh, supposed to expect so uh, this year, inshallah, 2021, yeah, we are uh, anticipating to see a very big difference as far as COVID response is concerned. We know uh, vaccination have started, and this is a, you know a total bull, you know game changer. Uh, why we say that is equal because no, vaccination is number one priority as far as uh, prevention of any infectious disease is concerned. So uh, when we have our vaccination completely rolled out to the public, you know we believe that the response definitely there will be we see significant improvement. So let the public expect that there will be mass you know roll out of vaccination campaign very soon. We have started already, and uh, uh, we are basing our you know program or campaign. Uh, on priority, you know, um, basis. We have seen uh, because of the number of um, doses we have, vaccine doses we have, we have to prioritize based on the risk population. Uh, the more risk you are, the you know, chance of having the vaccine force. So uh, we intend to um, vaccinate 60 percent of the population, which is about 1.3 million um, people. And very soon we will start this. Our World Bank, with the support of World Bank, we will be uh, having additional to what has already been acquired from the COVAX facility. So that additional um, uh, gap uh, that's going to be funded by World Bank is going to cater for about 40 percent of the population, plus the 20 percent we already have. So I wish this uh, within uh, a month or so, um, most of the Gambians will be vaccinated. And def definitely, this is something that we want to, um, you know, reveal to the general public that you know they should expect this and this will be definitely a game changer. So initially, uh, before the introduction of the vaccine into the country, yes, there were a lot of misconceptions, um, you know, there were a lot of uh, misinformation, fake news going on, and you know, because that's natural. Um, we've seen this even not only COVID, but before COVID. So uh, we were very much aware of this and uh, we have come up with mechanisms to deal with this. And this is why, you know, if you look at the way the vaccine was launched in the country, it has to have that high-level political commitment. So the president himself being the first person to get the vaccine, who is scared next? No, everybody should take it. So those are some of the things that were a problem. But um, when we see people coming out, for instance, the president took the shot, the ministers, the cabinet ministers, and we see religious leaders, Supreme, the head of Supreme Islamic Council, the head of Christian Council, they all come out and they show to the public that I am taking my vaccine. After that, we have seen an improvement. So I think, yes, there are still some uh, denials or you know reluctancy, but you know it has improved a lot. Um, in, uh, we have seen a lot of people coming forward, voluntary, to get themselves you know vaccinated. So and this is com uh, increasing day by day. Just um, two days ago, uh, yesterday. The security apparatus were ready and they said we are all going to take the vaccine. So we are seeing more people now demanding for the service than we expect. So I think it's changing because it was misconception. The things were, you know, they were wrongly communicated to, but now they got the fact and now we are seeing a lot of people coming forward to get themselves vaccinated. So that is very good. So it all has to do with trust and confidence. Before the COVID-19 outbreak, we have 100% or nearly 100% trust in our system. We know our health workers, whenever they talk, people know they are talking from, you know, not from political aspect, but they are talking about the realities. They are the experts in this. So it's about trust and confidence. I think people need to trust, especially Gambians, we need to trust our experts. We are not experts in politics. We are experts in health. So when we talk about health, let them understand this. Health is different from any other field. You know, if you, you cannot bring, you know, bring things in health and think, you know, that's how health is moved. Not everybody can come and say, this is how we, we should, this is how I see the vaccine, this is how... I, you have to ask the person, are you an expert in this? No, I am not. How do you know? 
then how do you know this is not working, this is not good? How do you know? They will never give you any evidence. And I believe Gambians should not be carried away by, you know, things that are, you know, there is no evidence in it. We, we have, the world have gone to, uh, above the stage now. Whatever, you, you know, information you have, verify it. Make sure it's backed by evidence before you accept it. So if we all do that way, no one will believe in the fake news. We will all see the reality. This is why God gives us the intellect for us to think and see whether this news is real or not. You can do it. it doesn't, you, have to, you don't have to be a rocket science to know that. By just hearing something, how can um, the, the, the scientists bring a vaccine into the country to kill all of us? Who in his right mind we think are in that direction? When we are relying 100% or nearly 100% on the scientists in, before the COVID, the, even, or even during the COVID, we are going to the health facility, to get our paracetamol or to get our antibiotics, you know. So do you think the scientists would wait until we are, when there is pandemonium, when there is pandemic and all those things to bring in something that kills people? So the world doesn't work like this. So I think people need to understand this. Let them reason that, you know, fake news will never take this country forward. Let them get the, real, the, 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 new, the, the right information from the right source and that way we will all be safe. Yeah. All right. I think that's all for now. Thank, Thank you. you very much. You're welcome. Yes. All right, thank you. Okay. <laughs>